I was going to set up 22 stuffed animals and run through the play on my basement floor. Welcome to week 14 of the tailgate. That's Ralph Bacchiano. I'm Michelle Marco. And what a weekend of New York football. The three longest win streaks in the NFC, the Saints, Washington, and the Giants. We're good streaky! Yeah. How unlikely was that win against the Seahawks? And how is it shaking up the NFC playoffs race? Well, when you consider that they went in there with Colt McCoy, it was incredibly unlikely. I think when you looked at the Giants' December schedule, that Seattle one stood out as the least likely for them to win. How it shook it up, I mean, you know, again, the Giants were down to a zero chance to make the playoffs. Matter of fact, we got our soon-to-be Emmy Award-winning graphics team to put together this neat little chart for us to explain exactly what's gone on this season. Now, you'll see up over here, way over here, <laughs> The Giants were 100% to make the playoffs at the start of the season. That's because I picked them to miss it. And you know that my predictions are never right. They plummeted with their first five losses. They got to 0-5. That was, you know, terrible. They did win a game against Washington. It gave them some balloons, but they didn't really increase their chances much. They lose a couple of other games. I declared it over at 1-7. A 0% chance of making the playoffs. They, yeah, they, their next game they may have won. They beat Washington, but nobody cared. And honestly, I was checking out by then. That's my grocery list. They started to win some more games. They beat Philadelphia. I'm still doodling. I just don't care at all. I'm looking forward to the bye week. Their chances, though, by then were up to 47%. They beat Cincinnati. It gets over 76%. Then they beat Seattle. And like I said, our crack analytics team, 99%. But then Washington wins the next day, and look what happens. It's a 50-50 toss-up the rest of the way. Giants have the tiebreaker over Washington, but Washington has a cake-like schedule down the stretch. No, I totally followed that the whole time. I just want to know how long it took our graphics team to make that. I would say probably days, really. Days. I mean, this is this wow. is high-tech stuff right here. Meanwhile, you can have a more opposite outcome with the Jets. Seconds away from the first one of the season, Greg Williams decides to blitz. They end up losing the game. Greg Williams loses his job. Is this just the first domino to fall? Well, it is the first domino to fall. Obviously, look, they're on their way to 0-16. I think that there's probably no chance that Adam Gates will return next season. So there's going to be a lot of bloodletting over at uh, Jets Drive when this season finally comes to an end. And, you know, they're going to look back on this play that this bizarre blitz call that Greg Williams had at the end of the game against the Raiders as a turning point. Now, maybe a good turning point because it could lead them to 0-16 and they'll get Trevor Lawrence, but it also could be rock bottom for them and just a symbol of how awful the Jets were. And really, I want to point this out to you because I've got our Emmy-winning graphics team on this as well. This is the play that we're talking about. And, you know, you know what happened, right? They the Raiders have 13 seconds to go 46 yards, and Greg Williams calls an all-out blitz. He sends this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, this guy, seven guys there. He takes this guy here. He just kind of leaves him floating around the middle. This guy goes in coverage. This guy goes in coverage, and at least poor Lamar Jackson all by himself on Henry Ruggs. And you know what happens there. There's a nice little touchdown pass, and the game's all over. There was one mistake, though, that would have turned this game around, and most people have missed it. And it's right here. You see, this is Greg Williams right here. This is Adam Gase. Adam Gase could have stopped all this by tackling Greg Williams, <gasps> taking that headset out of his hand and making sure he didn't make what might have been the worst defensive call in the history of pro football. The Giants defense has been absolutely outstanding as of late. So we decided to show them a little bit of love. Ralph, what, there's like 15 members that could possibly make the Pro Bowl this year? Oh, absolutely. Best defense in football. You know, kid, but there are a couple of guys. I mean, James Bradbury, a cornerback, Leonard Williams with eight and a half sacks. I mean, th th those two guys are as good as anybody in the league. And But, you know, I'm fine. You want to send the whole de defensive unit to the Pro Bowl? That works for me. All right, so I'm going to throw out a trivia question, and you are going to guess which member of the Giants defense it applies to, okay? Okay, I know them well. All right, number one. Which member of the Giants defense won three Georgia State wrestling titles during high school? Tay Crowder. No, Dalvin Tomlinson, the video gamer. He was finally given his championship ring this past summer from high wow. school. All right, so I'm 0 for 1. That's, that's, that's the last one I'll miss. Uh-huh, sure. And number two, which Giants defender took up jujitsu before the 2019 season? Wow. Um, I'm going to go with Jabril Peppers. No, Leonard Williams. He actually claims that it helps him work smarter, not harder. 
Wow, you'd think I would know some of these things. Let's try another one. All right, over two, number three. Which Giants defender is an amateur chef specializing in turkey burgers? <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm gonna go with, it's gotta be somebody who likes to eat, right? Let's go with Dexter Lawrence. First of all, who doesn't like to eat? That's a fair point. Okay, no, but James Bradbury, he actually had a digital cooking segment when he was with the Panthers. I actually knew that, I should have guessed him. Bam, uh -huh. bam! Yeah, yeah, he totally knew that. Okay, which Giants defender played high school basketball at St. Vincent St. Mary, which is where LeBron James went to high school? I know this one, it's Nico Lelos. Yes, good job. And Thank yeah, LeBron you. even tweeted at him before his first game. And he's been sensational. Two games so far in his NFL career, two huge turnovers for the Giants. Number five, which Giants defender had a 3.8 GPA in high school? Hey, you know what? He's a smart guy because he's come on this show. Let's go with Blake Martinez. No, it's not Blake Martinez. I'm sure, no, Blake Martinez is smart. I just... That's not who this is. I don't know what his GPA was in high school, but Jabril Peppers, uh, which it's his actual mom's favorite accomplishment of his, and he was aspiring to become a doctor before the whole football thing came about. Wow. Yeah, I know. Okay, last but not least, who can read Hebrew and also know sign language? Wow, that is a good question. Kyler Fackel. No, that's actually me. It's you? <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Time now for our comment section. Let's hear from our first fan. Hi, Tailgate. This is Kevin the Outlaw. I'm super excited about Trevor Lawrence, but what else do we have to do to ensure some wins next year? Well, what don't they need other than the starting quarterback? I mean, if they're going to have a new quarterback, I think the biggest thing is they're going to have to surround him with weapons. Unless you love the trio of Denzel Mims, Brashad Perriman, and Jamison Crowder, I would get more, maybe a tight end who can catch a little bit. They need basically everything. Yeah, what about a win this season? What about the impact that, that might have on the guys that will be there next year? Well, first of all, there may not be many of them. I mean, if you have all these guys and they go 0-16, you can certainly bring in almost anyone and do better than that. But I think the guys that are left are just going to have to adjust to a winning culture, which is something the Jets haven't had to adjust to in a while. Hey, Tailgate. Tommy Rock here. Giants defense has looked phenomenal past few weeks. But who needs to step up on the offense for this team to be a serious contender in the playoffs? The missing piece to me is the passing game and in particular, the big passing game. I want to see Darius Slate, who's been battling some injuries. I want to see him start to break out. Him and Daniel Jones forge that connection. It looks so promising. You're going to win games by hitting on those occasional big plays. And that's what they need to find. Ralph, you tweeted about the Leonard Williams trade. How has the fan perspective changed since that trade was made? Yeah, it's kind of amazing. Uh, you know, if I had run a poll on that trade in the months after it was made last October, the Giants sent a third and a fifth round pick to the Jets for Leonard Williams. It would have been 95% of Giants fans saying it was a terrible trade. But, you know, now Leonard Williams is with the Giants for another year. He has eight and a half sacks in 12 games, a career high. But it's complicated, too, because they could have waited a couple of months and gotten him in free agency, probably for a lot less money. So that still bothers them a little bit. They're still worried, can they resign him? How much is he gonna cost? All that type of thing. But I think if you look at the player and what he's done, you can see why Dave Gettleman really liked him and was so aggressive to get him because he has become that stud pass rusher that they've been missing for a lot of years. I'm in the pocket, Woo! I'm in the pocket. Woo! I'm in Time now for In the Pocket, where we try to put money in your pocket. The Giants are two and a half point underdogs at home against the Cardinals, Ralph. You know, I'm sticking on the Giants train with this one. The way they're playing right now, I think they should be able to beat the Cardinals by more than they beat the Seattle Seahawks. And they should be able to use the same formula too. You look at Seattle's offense, it was a mobile quarterback who could create on the run and one big number one receiver in DK Metcalf. Well, Arizona, Kyler Murray, a quarterback that can move and create on the run, one big receiver in DeAndre Hopkins. So let James Bradbury lock down Hopkins and then blitz and disguise the coverages and do what you can to confuse Murray. It worked against Seattle. It should work against the Cardinals easy. All right, well, turning to the Jets, they are 13 and a half point underdogs in Seattle. Yeah, and you know, I want to stay away from that spread because it's the Jets and they are bad. But, you know, the reality is they're starting to play some closer games here. So I think they are going to score enough points to keep this game closer. I will take the Jets and the points. I'm not saying the game will be close or that the Jets have a chance to win. I think 
Jamal Adams will make sure that he finds a way to uh, make the Jets lose another game. I really hope the Jets don't go 0-16. But Ralph, we gave you a couple weeks off. Uh, kind of a mental break of sorts for you. What is your lock of the week this week? Yeah, I needed that mental break. And uh, the best I could come up with after that time off is I'm taking the Texans, the Chicago Bears right now, six straight losses. They dream of being mediocre. They can't figure out who their quarterback is now or in the future. That team right now is a disaster. Uh, I'm surprised that the Texans aren't favored by a lot more. Ralph's lock of the week. And my lock of the week this week is the Colts. They are two and a half point favorites against the Raiders. Raiders barely got by the Jets last week, which shouldn't be that big of a challenge. And the Colts defense has looked really good. So that's that's my lock. Michelle's lock of the week. All right, well, that is it for this week's episode of The Tailgate. For Ralph Bacchiano, I'm Michelle Margot. We'll see you next week.